Well, hi. Welcome to this webcast. It's Jonathan Faust once again here. And I'm going to be offering a short meditation and tonight a talk on two really fundamental parts of, of practice. The capacity to pay attention on purpose and then the capacity to cultivate awareness. Foundational stuff. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, our time together. Good to have you here. Thank yous. Thank you to our producers, to Glenn Harrison and Leo Gimo for getting this out to you, to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for all they do. Shout out to my friends at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Arlington, Virginia, say that fast three times, now offering live classes on Monday night. Oh, and let's see. Well, there's always our wonderful mindful movement leader, Rita Moran, and our incredible mindful dialogue leader, Ray Manioki. For the full Monday night experience, 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, you can join Rita for mindful movement to help to prepare you for meditation and create the inner space for, uh, for listening to a talk. And then afterward, you can join Ray, who holds the space for a conversation around practice, around what you're noticing in your practice, anything from the talk that was uh, helpful or interesting or irritating. It's a great time to connect with like-minded people. So thank you both, uh, Rita and Ray, for your offerings. All of this is offered freely. There's no charge. The whole intention is that no one is ever denied access to these practices and teachings if they're interested. And it could only happen through generosity. So thank you so much for your support. If you ever feel called to uh, throw something this way, it's really helpful. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Finally, I have a newsletter which I send out from time to time with uh, encapsulation of talks and resources and updates and all that kind of stuff. Also, my, uh, my photography. So that's there, all on my website as well. I think that about covers it. One more thing, Tara and I are going to be offering a day-long retreat in November. I'll have the details soon, uh, but it's going to be a Catholic university also available online. And that'll be a that'll be a fun experience. We're looking forward to it. Alrighty, enough of that. Let's dive into a short yet brief yet deep and centering meditation. So when you're ready, it's really helpful just to pay attention first to kind of the grosser sensations, which means how does your body want to move? It's been a been a day might reach your arms up overhead, stretch up to the left side, to the right side, let out any sounds, see if you can freak out any pets or anyone living with you. And as you're ready, you can close your eyes. And, and as you close your eyes, just notice this possibility of falling inward. coming into a greater sense of what's actually happening on the inside right now. One of the most foundational elements of practice is the sense of coming into presence through this doorway of softening and relaxation. So you might imagine your forehead smooth. You might feel or imagine the muscles around your eyes relaxing or softening or letting go just a little bit. And from the inside out, just examine now if it's possible to, to relax the muscles all through the face. All the little micro expressions, relaxing, softening, letting go. And then directing your attention to the inside of your mouth. It's a very sensitive area here. Feel the, the tongue, the lips. One of my favorite practices, could you relax your tongue so fully that it fills your lower jaw? Is it possible now to relax your jaw? Let the jaw open a little bit. Let it, let it possibly kind of hang from the skull. A 
Feel the space inside your throat. You might feel or imagine the space inside your lungs as you breathe. And you might now feel or imagine the, the volume, the weight, the heaviness of your arms. And imagine the, the heaviness of the arms just inviting you into a deeper and deeper sense of, of relaxation, of presence. Letting your awareness now shift to the lower belly, to the abdomen, to the lower back, to the buttocks. What could soften or relax here? How intimately can you feel the subtlety of the breath down really deep in your belly? Sensing now from the inside out the, the weight and the volume of your legs. From the hip joints down through the knees. The knees down through the ankles. The tops of the feet and the toes. Sensing now the soles of the feet and the heels. And as you sense now from the crown of the head down through the, the heels, what could relax or soften or let go right now? From this place of, of relaxation, of softening, you might now explore this element of concentration, choosing an anchor, breath or sound or the feeling in the palms. Let your attention now turn toward your anchor. Notice what it feels like from the inside, the breath in the belly or the nostrils. or the sound vibrations, or this feeling tone in the palms, fingers and thumbs. And notice now if it's possible to, to hold your concentration here, to sustain attention. The mind naturally is gonna wander. In that moment, just notice and then sense if you can bring your attention back. You may notice how quickly your attention is pulled away. There's no condemnation of thinking in this practice. There's simply noticing when the mind has wandered and then the power of returning, of refocusing, softening inside, settling your attention back on your anchor. And if just for a few moments, being fully awake and fully alive in the here and now,
as you relax and soften, you may notice two elements at play. One is this element of concentration, of paying attention on purpose. Another element is this element of mindfulness, of awareness itself, non-judging, non-grasping, not even trying to figure things out, just simply aware. And you might explore, if it feels right for you, widening your attention beyond your anchor to notice everything that changes. And here you might toggle back and forth from awareness of your anchor to re-arrive and then widening and broadening and opening to this sense of the fullness of here and now. Exploring two questions. The first question, what exactly is happening right now? What are you experiencing right now? The second question, can you let it be? One element of practice is concentration focus. Another element of practice is awareness of change or flow. A third quality of practice is simply resting in presence. And you might just in this last little bit, let go of all technique. Let your anchor fall away. Is it possible to let everything be just as it is? Nothing to do, nowhere to go, just simply to be. And you might now gently bring your attention to your breathing and lengthen the inhalation just a little bit and consciously relax on the exhalation. Relax, soften, and just sense all that has shifted and changed and moved in your experience in the last 15 minutes. Feeling the imprint of this time of practice. And as you're ready, gently beginning your transition. Let your body move and stretch in any way that feels good. Taking your time. There's no hurry. There's, there's no rush.
and welcome back. I'd like to talk about two things, share two things with you. As always, a little bit of yakking from me, but also some experiential stuff you can try on. I'd like to talk about concentration and mindfulness. Uh, to summarize, concentration is your power of focus. And mindfulness is the power of awareness. And these two work, work hand in hand. Creativity arises out of, out of mindfulness, out of non-judging awareness. And we'll talk a little bit about creativity. And um, one of the areas I want to talk about with you is Kickstarter. If you're not familiar with Kickstarter, it is this kind of like place where people seed uh, money for all kinds of creative projects. It's where um, people who see the possible where it didn't exist before. And recently, someone created a panini press that would toast the face of Jesus on your bread. It has raised $25,000 last time I checked. The name of this panini press? <laughs> Grilled Cheeses. So I hope this has tantalized you to listen to the rest of this talk. <laughs> Uh, this is actually kind of a classical talk that explores this balance and practice. I, I'd like to talk about how, how concentration is power. When you are concentrated, things get done. Secondly, I'd like to talk about how you can actually develop concentration. There are techniques and tools that will be really helpful for you. Now, I'd also like to talk about mindfulness, how mindfulness is awareness and how mindfulness actually leads to, to liberation, to, to freedom, to happiness, to joy. And then some of the techniques that you can use to develop more mindfulness in your life. As I've mentioned before, I, I grew up on a farm. I worked on a farm all through college. And one of the things I really loved about working on a farm was the incredible toys we had to play with. It ran about a thousand acres, so we had a lot of really cool toys. And one of them was an oxyacetylene torch. If you're not familiar with an oxyacetylene torch, uh, it produces a very, very hot, very concentrated flame. When you light up to cut the uh, oxyacetylene torch, it just cuts through metal like, like butter. It was really fun working with the uh, working with the oxyacetylene torch, I got to play a lot. I got to see the power of having that flame available. And in that same way, when you're really concentrated in life, you can cut through what needs to be done. You know that feeling, that intensity when you've got to get it done and everything falls away and you are focused. On the other hand, times when we lose our focus and lose our concentration, when you're unsure about what to do, when you procrastinate, when you're susceptible to distractions, life is kind of miserable. I've noticed that not just myself, but a lot of people will rely on deadlines to create that sense of intensity. Procrastination builds, tension builds, and suddenly you're giving it everything you have because of that deadline. What it really comes down to, and I just appreciate this more and more and more in my life, is how learning how to control your attention is kind of everything. <laughs> I've always admired the, the people in school who could do their schoolwork like a job. They'd be focused during the day and they'd take the evening to relax. I could never do that. It never really worked for me. So concentration is power. If you try to do too many things at the same time, you simply will not be effective. It's pretty conclusive that studies have shown that multitasking really isn't possible. You end up trying to do too many things and then you end up doing nothing very well. Maybe you've noticed this. <laughs> so your capacity to concentrate is commensurate to your capacity to actually 
get things done. With concentration, you can persevere through, through the greatest challenges. And there are all kinds of techniques for focusing in an ADD world. And maybe you've noticed you're a little more ADD than you were before. I certainly am. I'm really aware that my reading comprehension has really gotten fractured as my, as my attention has gotten fractured. I was in a conversation with someone around uh, an editor, around a book idea I had, and she was telling me how she used to read philosophy books, and now she just doesn't have that attention. So how do you actually focus your attention? Well, one technique that I've done, um, which I've talked about before, is the Pomodoro technique. Um, this is kind of my go-to, been for, for quite a few years. The Pomodoro technique was created by this med student in Italy who really needed to focus. And he had a timer, a kitchen timer in the shape of a tomato, hence Pomodoro. And he was set up for 25 minutes, focus, and then take a five minute break, another 25 minutes, five minute break, 25 minutes, five minute break, 25 minutes, five minute break, and then a longer break. I got excited about that and I found it to be really, really effective. In 25 minutes, I could get more done than I could with my mind being a kind of unrestricted. Otherwise, sailboat without a rudder, just my mind would go in any direction. I would also, <laughs> I would also do the Pomodoro technique with uh, headphones and listening to a uh, dual binaural beat uh, change my brainwave state. So that's what I do when I'm desperate. It's a really helpful technique. I remember there was someone who shared this with his son who was struggling in school. He said, look, for 25 minutes, you focus. And his, his son was just blown away by how much he got done. He said, this would have taken me all night, but I actually got it done in 25 minutes. So that's a technique. Artificial, you set up the boundaries, you focus for 25 minutes. And the key is you take a force break. What I've noticed is I'll be really on a roll at 25 minutes and I'll push through and I'll go to like 55 minutes and I've kind of blown out my brain. I've lost my, uh, kind of lost my capacity or my focus. The other thing that I do that's really helpful for developing concentration is I choose three things at the beginning of the day. I write them down and I just say to myself, if I get these three things done, it's, it's a great day. Then I start with the hardest thing on the, on the list. And that taking that power to push through the hardest thing is such an esteem builder and it just kind of gets energy rolling. The third thing I would say is spending less time focusing on what I'm doing and more time focusing on managing my energy. I've really come to see that I have windows of creativity and focus that are available to me. And I think it's all part of aging that those windows are shorter. <laughs> so I've got a good three or four hours a day where I can really focus and create some new stuff. And then the rest of the time is more kind of admin and all that. So be aware of managing your energy. What this really comes back to again is like, you can learn how to control how you focus your attention. And as is said again and again and again, all this stuff is swimming upstream. You're swimming against the culture because our culture is about more and more and more and now and now and now and faster and faster and faster. It's all instant gratification. There's constant competition for your attention. Ads, 5,000 ads a day are flashing in front of your brain. Remember once my uncle came back from the grocery store and he was, he was unpacking the bags. He saw something, he said, I'm, why would I buy this? I've never bought this before. Uh, some kind of fabric softener or something. And he realized later that he'd been listening to the ad all day on the radio. We just don't realize how much our attention is taken away by all the distracting voices out there. So it's important to remember that, that meditation is a strategy for developing your attention. If you have trouble sustaining thought on a particular project, 
or developing your grit or perseverance, this really makes a difference. Most people I know are plagued by this pull toward instant gratification, toward multitasking, toward distraction. Years ago, as I was on a meditation retreat, a month-long meditation retreat, and suddenly it just flashed into my brain. I thought, oh my gosh, this is, I'm training my brain. This is simply training myself. It's taking this wild horse and training it how to stay in the corral. The other analogy is when you do this training, it's like training a puppy. Puppies are pretty ADD. Patience and persistence. Puppies will learn how to sit for longer and longer periods of time. Some puppies, I've had some that don't. So there are many different techniques of meditation. And they range from concentration to mindfulness to inquiry to heart practices to contemplation. But in many ways, the precursor of all this is concentration. Like it says in some lottery advertisements, you have to be present to win. You've got to be present for these practices. And no doubt when you first start watching the breath, you might not be able to, to sustain your attention on the breath for more than 10 seconds before a memory comes in or a thought about the future or commentary on what's happening. It's very challenging to do this practice, period. Especially when you're scattered you have so many demands on your attention. When, you're, when your attention is fractured, calling it back. Wow. It's, it's challenging for everyone, for everyone. When you think about everything you've got going on in your life, all the roles you play in life, it's no, no, no wonder that it's hard to concentrate on one thing or hard to bring yourself to be fully present. Think about all the ads, those 5,000 ads that flash in front of you. How do we cut through that and arrive? Just focusing on the breath, sometimes that can be too subtle. Many, many years ago, I did my first month-long retreat and was in a conversation with Gil Fronstall and uh, He's one of the senior teachers, one of my teacher I really admire. And I have a kind of a background, pretty strong background in yoga. And we were just talking about practice. And he said, you know, for people who are like living an urban lifestyle with lots of stress, the breath might be, that might not be appropriate. You might actually need something more physical to, to kind of calm and bring yourself present. And this, of course, totally makes sense to me. And I've just noticed how many people will tell me when they hear I have a, a background in yoga. They'll say like, oh, you know, I love yoga. I hate meditation. It's really the same practice. But when you're in a yoga pose and you're hanging on for dear life, it's pretty easy to be present. <laughs> when you're focusing on the subtlety of the breath, it's a little bit more challenging. So I'd like to share with you probably one of my favorite go-to techniques for cultivating concentration and cultivating absorption. If you're driving, I recommend you not do this. Um, this will take just a few minutes, but the invitation here is to really let your attention become focused on, on your anchor. Mindfulness focuses on having an anchor for concentration. The anchor of attention is traditionally the breath. Sometimes it sounds. It can be the feeling in your palms, feeling in your fingers. Any, any sense, anything in the sense world can become an anchor. This is a sense-based practice. It's not a mental technique. It's coming into the, the reality and the actuality of sensation. So our practice here is going to be in the hands, bringing your attention into the hands. And I'm going to see if I can adjust my posture. So if you would, if you're up for this, this will take just a couple of minutes, you might shake out your hands. 
You might let the shaking be a little more vigorous. And maybe a little more vigorous. And now, as you're ready, bring your hands right about at face level. And as you're ready, you can close your eyes. And now relax your fingers. Relax your thumbs. And let your awareness flood into the palms and fingers and thumbs. And notice what you feel. You might feel some tingling or maybe some pulse. And now imagine that if someone was watching you, they could barely perceive movement. And as you're ready, let your hands begin a slow motion descent. Again, if someone was watching you, they could barely perceive movement. And sense, if you can, the smallest unit of movement in your awareness. If the mind is active, bring your attention back to the anchor, the micro movements of your hands as they flow through space. You might soften the muscles of your face, relax your tongue. How intimately can you feel the hands as they flow through space. If your palms, your hands have come to rest, keep your attention in your hands. If your hands are still in transit, you might just take those next few moments to continue. What could relax? How intimately can you feel the micro movements of your hands? Now, wherever you find your hands, you might let them come to rest and now completely and deeply relax and feel. Can you sense the imprint, the effect of this technique, just a few minutes? So, if you like, you can open your eyes. If You can also keep your eyes closed. The question here is, what did you notice? You may have noticed a deepening sense of absorption, like a deepening sense of, of awareness drawn inward to, to really feel that moment to moment to moment sensation of the hands. You may have had that sustained attention to the here and now. Or maybe it was difficult. Or maybe you've dropped into a sense of flow. Maybe you may have noticed that you weren't analyzing your experience, but you were more intimately present. And maybe, no promises, you might feel a little more here, a little more calm, maybe a deeper sense of what's actually happening, maybe less distracted. This is what concentration does. It's, it's calming. Shamatha is, is a calming of the mind. And it's paradoxical because I usually think of concentration as hard work, but not necessarily. It's this calling of attention to this almost like a pinpoint of here and now. 
This technique of the, the slow, ultra slow motion release of the hands, I often will do in the beginning of meditation to, to cultivate that sense of, of deepening concentration absorption. It's a wonderful preparatory experience. There's a practice uh, which I trained in decades ago called Kumnai, which is this practice of ultra slow motion movement. And oh my God, it's so intense. You would do your arms out to the side and bring them overhead. And I think it was like one minute up and then one minute down. And you do it seven times. It was either, either excruciating or blissful. <laughs> That's what I found, not much in between. But you might try sometimes just even working at your desk. You know, take like 15 breaths to bring your shoulders from down up toward your ears. And again, like 15 breaths, that slow motion movement is this immediate, accessible way to cultivate a sense of concentration and absorption. There's so much, I could talk about concentration a lot. It's so fundamental and some aspects of practice really dial in on concentration. But if you've heard me before, you've probably heard me say how concentration is not the end of practice. You can go very, very deep in concentration practices and you can receive immense benefits. There are beautiful teachings on the details of concentration practice and all it can provide you. It's so fundamental. And as I've shared, there are some lots of very concentrated people on this planet who are miserable. Concentration does not equal freedom or liberation or happiness. And this is where this element of mindfulness comes in, of non-judging awareness, of non-grasping awareness. I think I would categorize myself as a cultural creative. You know, I, I love, I love technology. I, I love hacking. I love looking for new ways of, of doing things. And people who know me well have an ongoing joke about the, the latest gizmo that I've, I've, I've come up with. My friend Michael said, oh my God, well, what, do you, what is it now? I said, oh, it's a pen, but it turns into an umbrella and, and you can charge your phone with it. I really love design and, and I love creativity. And I had mentioned Kickstarter, um, this place where come up, people come up with new ideas, looking for funding. And um, it's really interesting. I mean, some of the, some, some cool products that I've, that I've backed that I really appreciate and some really harebrained ones. Um, here's someone who created an ice chest that also includes a blender a Bluetooth speaker, a USB charger, a bottle opener, and a storage bin for plates. Eight million dollars pledged. Someone created something called iFetch, an automated tennis ball tosser for your dog. Now that makes sense. Someone invented a miniature shotgun that shoots salt to kill flies. <laughs> Someone created something called the CH4. It measures how much gas you pass per day, so you can correlate that to the foods that you eat. And for some reason, people got behind a guy who wanted to make potato salad as a joke. He started a Kickstarter campaign as a joke to find the perfect potato salad recipe. And he got $55,000. And he ended up uh, doing some really cool things for the homeless in his area with that money. I'm assuming it included some potato salad. Here's the interesting thing is that when you when you ha get this sense of here and now, that present moment absorption, it actually opens up mindfulness. It helps to you to shift out of the linear rational mind and actually come into the raw experience of here and now, which can open up incredible creativity. It opens up insight. Maybe you've noticed in your practice how 
you see some patterns that are no longer useful. Maybe some beliefs that really aren't true that you were believing before. Maybe you've noticed relationships shifting, or maybe some new creativity, or maybe just as simple as you're not quite as anxious as you were before. This is the awakening of mindfulness. As you are less caught in your patterns, your awareness is more free. And the result is an increase in intuition and increase in intelligence. You're shifting your consciousness. And as Einstein famously said, no problem was solved in the same consciousness that created it. So you start to feel a shift. You're no longer bound by the linear rational mind. But there are these moments in this deep rest of absorption when you can begin to see from a new perspective. It's like taking off on an airplane on a rainy day. You know, you're on the runway, fogged in, 2,000 feet fogged in, and then you make your way up to 10,000 feet or 30,000 feet, and suddenly the clouds fall away and you're in open sky. That's what mindfulness can bring you. You release your identification from this tightly bound self and you begin to sense that, that field of infinite possibility. And when you shift your consciousness, you see things from a different perspective. So concentration is the lens. You can close down the aperture, you can zoom in the lens. You have this capacity to make your attention like a laser. That, that, that intimate, like what, I love that inquiry, like what's the smallest unit of movement I can perceive in that slow motion movement of the hands? You're getting incredibly granular through that practice of concentration. You can also open concentration up wide. So the question is, there are all these techniques for, for concentration. Now there, in fact, there are three things that I found really, really helpful. And I'm aware of the time, but I want to share these with you. And I have shared these before. But if you like, um, you can close your eyes and feel your breath. And I love these three instructions for anapanasati, for, for the breath-based meditation. If you're using breath as your anchor, when your mind has wandered, when you've lost your concentration, here's the first suggestion. Count the next five inhalations from one to five. Now you may have noticed that counting from one to five helped you to come more into a sense of here and now, more aware of the breath as you're breathing. The second will take just maybe 30 seconds to explore this next question. How intimately can you locate the experience of breathing on the inside? And again, you may notice that you start to feel things you hadn't felt before. Now this next one, it's really subtle. Again, we'll take the next 30 seconds or so. Is the next inhalation shorter or longer than the inhalation preceding it? Is the next inhalation shorter or longer than the inhalation preceding it?
letting this technique drop now. And again, just feel the effect. If you like, you can open your eyes. You may have noticed that these three questions, you know, can you count the inhalation you know, from one to five? How intimately can you locate the sensations inside? And is this next inhalation shorter or longer than the inhalation preceding? They're all questions and inquiries that take you in. In order to respond to that inquiry or that question, you have to move into very, very subtle attention. Very, very powerful. So I just wanted to offer those because those are really practical, pragmatic things that you can do to really help you to cultivate concentration in a world that is not excited about you being concentrated. Everyone wants your attention. As you start to get more control over your attention, the, the, these, I hope, will, will be helpful. There have been times when I'm on a long retreat where I've actually asked the question, it's a little bit of playing games, but it was interesting, it was like, is this next inhalation shorter or longer than the inhalation preceding the last inhalation. <laughs> wow, you really got to you got to get subtle for that one. I think that was maybe like week three out of, out of four weeks when I could actually explore that. So there are techniques for cultivating concentration. How do you cultivate awareness? How do you how do you become more aware? Well, I've noticed that for me, the most interesting people are those who have suffered and grown through their suffering. Those who have experienced sickness, old age, death, loss, healing through betrayal. <laughs> Those who have moved through it with compassion and with a greater sense of wisdom, those are really juicy people. And we, we have a sense of, of what we think is real. And then we find out through life what's actually true. Concentration helps us to come in contact with what's here. Mindfulness, or as I like to think of it, non-judging awareness, helps us actually to see into the nature of reality itself. So again, the question becomes, how do you become aware of awareness? This gets subtle and gets pretty wild. Let's try a little practice. Again, if you like, you can close your eyes. If you're driving, please don't. You might take three slow breaths. Now, one of the most powerful doorways for meditation, I find, is the sound meditation. You might take a few moments and just notice 360 degrees all the sounds that you can perceive right now. Notice the sounds that are the closest to you. And is it possible to identify the sounds that are, that are at the, the very edge of your capacity to feel or experience. Now there, there are two ways to listen. One is through the linear rational mind and it happens automatically. You'll hear a sound, the mind will locate the sound the mind will give it a name, and then the mind will determine whether it's a threat or not. You might just notice that capacity, location, name, determining its threat level. A 
There's another way of listening, which is often referred to as bare attention, which is listening without a story. It's experiencing the pure sound vibration just as it is. And you might sense now, if that's possible, can you simply feel or experience the sound vibrations without a story? Now, as you sense the sounds, let yourself investigate the following question. Can you feel or imagine the silence behind the sounds? Can you imagine that you can hear better by not trying, but by simply deeply relaxing and receiving the sounds? And now you might sense that which is aware can you locate that which is aware right now and now letting this all fall away just again feel the impact feel the imprint So if you like, you can open your eyes. Concentration is the lens. You turn, you focus. Mindfulness is like the film or the chip that's recording what's there. It's not good or bad. It's not making any commentary. It's simply like, oh, this is what's happening. And so it brings in these two questions. Concentration, what exactly is happening right now? And mindfulness, can you be with it? Can you let it be? And this is what plays into a mindful life, the two wings of practice. You know what it's like when you go away on a vacation and you get some new perspective? Or maybe someone close to you passes away and you have this like new sense of what's most important in your life. That is the awakening of mindfulness. It's, it's the vision, it's the field of awareness itself. Concentration is kind of the execution. It's the, it's the focus. Awareness is the background. So what does this lead to? I'll tell you in the last few minutes here. <laughs> You engage in these practices of concentration, of paying attention on purpose. You remove distractions. You create a more and more of a sense of absorption. You kind of calm the mind. You develop your capacity to be fully present. You explore these practices of allowing, of simply noticing what's here, of non-judging, of non-grasping. And you start to see more into the nature of reality itself. These, these three characteristics of reality. You begin to notice that, my gosh, everything's changing. Everything is changing. This rule of impermanence. Then you begin to notice that everything you hold on to has got some quality of rope burn. And you notice everything you, you can let go of results in a greater sense of ease. This element of dukkha, the, the, the whole key around stress and suffering, the capacity to, to let go of what we're holding on to, 
opens up new possibilities. And then you begin to see into the nature of, of the self itself, how there are two elements to you. One of you is deeply conditioned. Your body is subject to change. Your thoughts, your emotions are subject to change. Your beliefs are subject to change. Everything temporal is going to fall away. And yet, perhaps there's this sense of something that's unchanging. This glimpse comes more alive in your practice. So the flower of practice is referred to as equanimity. I like to think of it as, as steadiness. No matter what's happening externally, there's this quality of presence that becomes more alive. And we begin to see that there's conditional happiness, the happiness that is utterly dependent on externals, and then this really cool, unconditional happiness. The capacity to be fully present, non-judging, non-grasping, non-desiring, no matter what's happening outside. It's not easy, but I think that's what's possible. Sokni Rinpoche, who grew up in a monastery in Tibet as a young kid, that his, his teacher would basically give him this instruction this, to be happy for no reason. I just love that image of like a little six-year-old in Tibet. Like that's his, that's his instruction, be happy for no reason. And it points toward that sense of unconditional happiness. So what do you do? Do you work on concentration? Do you work on mindfulness? Do you explore more compassion practices? Do you explore rain and investigating what's between you and feeling free? Well, that's up to you. As the, as the Buddha allegedly said, finding your dharma is your dharma. Finding your path is your path. And I fully believe that the more you simply give yourself to to the present moment the more you will intuitively be guided that you will sense when it would be really really helpful to lean in develop more concentration burn through the distractions and really bring yourself here sit up a little straighter and you'll also begin to recognize when you're gripping too tight when you might soften when you might explore relaxing back a little bit. This beautiful teaching of the middle way, not too tight, not too loose, is an exquisitely profound and deep practice because the middle way, not too tight, not too loose, is a moving target, constantly moving target. And this becomes this incredible doorway back to presence. What is happening right now? Can I be with it? Or what's happening right now? And is there a sense of how this wants me to be with it? I like that inquiry a lot. Because that question, how does this moment want me to be with it, sparks that sense of intuition, of insight, and wisdom. So many blessings to you in your practice. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I wish you well, and I look forward to being with you again. Happy, happy trails.